Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about homelessness and substance use disorder treatment. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. H. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Richard Cho, Director of Innovations and Research, Corporation for Supportive Housing, New Haven, Connecticut. Robert Kershaw, business owner and outreach worker, Oxford House Incorporated, Silver Spring, Maryland. Dr. Jesse B. Milby, Director, Medical Psychology, Substance Abuse and Homeless Research Program, Department of Psychology, University of Alabama at Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama. Dr. Clark, when is a person categorized as homeless? Well, the most important thing is to recognize that when a person lacks a permanent fixed residence, uh, they meet the category of homeless. Uh, there are a number of temporary uh, arrangements that people have. For instance, uh, it's estimated that uh, roughly 1.6 million people are living in, in transitional shel or shelters, and they also meet the definition of homeless. So it's uh, we're looking for people who have permanent fixed residence, uh, and if you don't have that, then you're uh, defined as homeless. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Milby, can you sort of take us through those categories a little bit? Well, there, there are lots of uh, services that are provided for the homeless, from basic emergency shelters that just provide overnight stay and people have to leave uh, after you usually serve breakfast and then have to leave after. There are shelters that are more permanent and give uh, people a chance to find more permanent housing. There are shelters also for uh, women with children, for example, so a whole families uh, can uh, stay in a sheltered situation. So there are lots of different categories of services. And who are typically, um, uh, Richard, the people that are going into these uh, and availing themselves of these services? Well, I think it's important to understand that there's actually several categories of, of homeless persons. Um, there's, on the one hand, people who are transitionally homeless, people who spend uh, very short periods of time in one of the emergency systems uh, and then who basically make it out on their own uh, as well as people who are um, uh, chronically homeless who spend uh, many many years or months um, uh, in, in homeless shelters or on the streets uh, and even among the chronically homeless there are a number of people who uh, spend primarily most of their time on the streets as opposed to other people who spend a lot of time in homeless shelters and in another category people who cycle in and out of ma many different kinds of homeless services as well as emergency services and institutions. And Robert, there are so many um, aspects to doing outreach to the homeless population. Um, what are uh, some of the approaches that one uses to really go out and identify uh, these individuals? Well, one of the approaches in which we use is visit. We visit a lot of shelters. Uh, we visit a lot of shelters. Uh, we go to a lot of the rooms of of recovery individuals because you find a lot of individuals that are homeless that are seeking help. They tend to uh, go there for that support. And that's where we find a lot of individuals in our outreach. Dr. Clark, one of the issues um, that was in our, our briefing packets was the, the whole notion that uh, a, a great number of people that are homeless have an addiction problem. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that and tell us um, uh, how the addiction then causes the homelessness. Well, it's important to realize that uh, the addiction can either be the cause of homelessness or can result from homelessness. When you realize that on a given night over 700,000 individuals may be homeless, you understand that those individuals are, are often going through a great deal of stress. Now, the stress may have been caused because of the alcohol and drug use. You lose your family, you lose your job, uh, you can't pay your rent or your mortgage, and as a result, you find yourself out on the street. Or uh, if you are homeless due to the economy or due to some other uh, reason, uh, you resort to alcohol and drugs to self-medicate. Uh, from the uh, perspective of the services needed by the individual, uh, it's important for the provider to have a good understanding of both situations. And which are the groups that are mostly affected? Shall we say, are there, for example, a lot of the 
homeless population? Are there veterans? Were they veterans, for example, Dr. Milby? We, uh, there's there's uh, survey data to suggest somewhere around 20 to 25 percent of homeless people are veterans. That's a, that's a lot of veterans. And uh, the VA has special services designed for homeless veterans, and they uh, and those services are expanding now. And some of these veterans, Dr. Clark, have family, so it really doesn't affect just the individual that is homeless, but how does it affect the entire family? Well, I think uh, for any homeless context, if uh, the uh, principal provider loses his or her ability to earn, whether the alcohol and drugs caused or the mental illness caused the homelessness or whether the alcohol and drugs or the anxiety or stress or depression was a result of being homeless, uh, that affects the whole family. Uh, and that's a, a key construct. When we're dealing with uh, veterans, we may be dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, particularly those who have uh, combat, and uh, we, we need to recognize that that PTSD, in addition to the alcohol and drugs, uh, also affects the, not only the individual, but that individual's family. So as a society, we have an obligation to our men and women in, who serve uh, to make sure that we're addressing the full range of, of, of issues associated with their homelessness or their alcohol or drug use or their post-traumatic stress disorder. And the family members who supported uh, the individual who served who may be affected by uh, that sort of dislocation may need uh, special services dealing with that. So uh, when we're talking about services, we're talking about that full range of things. Uh, one of the, I think, uh, fortunate things is the amount of growth in the federal investment in programs that serve the, the uh, homeless veterans. And, and of those, I think the um, most important development is uh, the, the expansion of permanent supportive housing options for people who, um, who are veterans and who are homeless. Um, and the Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Program is one of the, I think, most promising models that have um, arisen in the past couple of years. Very good. Is that a recent initiative, or uh, it is something that actually has um, increased in in recent years? Um, and there are many thousands of vouchers that are uh, being provided, um, where the local VAs are providing some of the clinical supports um, and are partnering with public housing authorities to provide the rental assistance. And what we want to do is make sure that the safety net that is not met by the VA is offered by uh, non-VA services. The VA obviously has the lead, they have the resources, mm -hmm. but sometimes there's an alienation that occurs between the VA and as a government institution and uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, community organizations who can uh, assist the VA because uh, if the person is otherwise entitled to VA benefits but is alienated from the VA, uh, one of the efforts is to help connect that person to VA services. So uh, community organizations, community coalitions can help function as, uh, shall we say, expediters, moving the person uh, from the uh, non-VA recognized status to a VA recognized status, working with uh, uh, veteran service organizations to engage that person. So if they're eligible for VA benefits, they, they can capitalize off of that full range of benefits. Mm -hmm. Richard, what other populations are the youth or women affected by homelessness as well? Absolutely. Um, and with women in particular, um, there's both single women who are primarily using the set of homeless services that are tailored towards homeless single adults. Uh, as well as women with children, um, so many families are affected um, and um, they face a number of challenges, um, both encounters with the criminal justice system, uh, but also encounters with the child welfare system um, and where their substance use often is a complicating factor with regard to their ability to keep custody of their children. Um, so that is another, I think, challenge that needs to be met. And, you know, it, it's almost like a very um, uh uh, 360 circle. The women are homeless, the children go into foster care, then the children when they leave foster care then become homeless themselves. Is that the case that you've seen, Robert? Yes, that's been the case. And, 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 and in our model, one of the things, the, one of the major focuses that we have are, are being able to provide housing for a, 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 an individual, but not necessarily the family. Uh, and that's been one of our major hurdles. We're trying to work with that and, and, and create more houses for women with children uh, in this area. Robert, you yourself are, are have experienced homelessness. You want to tell us a little bit and what, what got you there and, and what you're doing now? Uh, yeah, well, uh, 
being a, a, a veteran, I can certainly uh, uh, identify with a lot of the, the, the issues there, and especially with some of the programs there. One of the things that, that uh, got me to that point was my uh, not being willing to accept the fact that I uh, suffered from an, from an addiction. Uh, and throughout the course of, of, of the years, it just became overwhelming. And of course, the, the, the resulting consequences ended up with me being just that homeless. Uh, with nowhere to go and no one to turn to. Uh, and it wasn't until I actually accepted the fact that I had a, a problem, that I sought help. And one of the first places that I turned to uh, was a social service agency where they had a veteran uh, administrator there. And uh, they were attempting to get me into a long-term treatment program, uh, which didn't materialize. In the meantime, I went to a social uh, uh, treatment agency, a 28-day program. And that program lasted for me for 35 days. I actually stayed there so long, I thought that I really uh, was teaching the program. <laughs> but what happened was it's just that the, the, the programs themselves are cyclic. The information just goes around. And uh, eventually I was waiting to get to the long-term program. And uh, through the benefit of, of, of contacts and networking, uh, what presented itself was an opportunity to move into an Oxford house. Uh, decision which I chose and which has changed my life dramatically uh, from the self-run, self-supported environment to the taking responsibility for my life and my recovery, uh, it's unparalleled. It's unparalleled. And to that point that I'm now a business owner and I actually work for the Oxford organization. So uh, I, I, I strongly to anyone would recommend that that would be one of the first opportunities. First and foremost, seek help. Mm -hmm. Seek help. Well, when we come back, I want to start talking about that whole issue of seeking help. How does one begin to identify, assess the populations, and then begin to get them into some type of stability in order to end their homelessness? We'll be right back. It's important for us to realize that uh, homelessness is a, a condition that is often related to substance use disorders or to serious mental illness. Roughly 20% of individuals who are homeless have a serious mental illness, and almost two-thirds of in the individuals who are homeless have a substance use disorder. So it's important for us to keep that in mind. And what supportive housing would do is to provide services in a context to allow uh, a person to uh, remain clean and sober or to pursue uh, being clean and sober. And uh, as a result of that, we facilitate not only uh, housing itself, but also recovery from substance use. The HEART Act is very, very helpful insofar as it has broadened the definition of homelessness substantially. In broadening the definition, it includes populations who are at risk of being homeless, who may not be currently homeless in the actual moment. So for example, someone who will not have a secure place to live within 14 days of being discharged from a hospital or an institution of any type or uh, incarceration uh, will be eligible for resources through the Housing and Urban Development Department through the uh, Continuum of Care program. Also, the broadening of the definition to include families and children is very, very important insofar as families and children are at greater risk of having homelessness be a problem and of having other disabilities along the way, such as mental illness and substance abuse problems and other co-occurring issues. So if we can capture and take care of and house uh, those persons who are families with children early on, uh, we're going to be in a better position to reduce the problem of chronic homelessness later on in, in, in their lives. When you have a drug or alcohol problem, your whole world stops making sense. You can get help for yourself or a loved one and make sense of life again. For information, treatment referral, and most importantly, help. 
Call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. What is the cost of drug and alcohol addiction? I lost my job. I lost my home. I lost my health. I lost my self-respect. I lost my freedom. If you have a drug or alcohol problem, remember treatment is effective and recovery is possible. For information on drug and alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP and see what you could save. I got my life back. the path that my life has taken, it has allowed me to be able to, to parallel experiences with people, uh, being able to talk to the homeless individual because I've been there. I've been homeless. Uh, I, I've slept on concrete. Uh, I've looked for uh, any type of shelter that I could just for a moment, just for an hour. So I can, I can relate to that. Uh, I have been imprisoned. Uh, I, I, you know, so I can relate to the individual fresh out of jail and, 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 and their struggles. I can relate to veterans because I am a vet. So when you have that, that camaraderie, it's the same as if you're in a foxhole together, you know, as a military guy, you know, they become not just the guy in another uniform, but it comes your family as your brother because you got to look out for each other. And it's the same thing in this path of recovery. I find that I'm better able to relate to people because we have that, that familial sense of, hey, I've been there, brother. I know what it's like. I, I, I empathize, not sympathize with you. So I, I, I thoroughly understand what you're going through. It's really aided me immeasurably. Dr. Milby, approximately 600,000 families, including 1.35 million children, are said to be homeless. What kind of dynamics happens when, when this occurs? Well, um, this is the fastest growing segment of the homeless population, actually, with women and children. And women and, and children have increased um, in the last several year surveys we've had. Um, and, you know, addiction plays a part sometimes. Uh, the economic situation plays a part. The breakup of a marriage or a family, and then women are left to, to negotiate and try to provide for children by themselves and wind up uh, being homeless and looking to community support for emergency housing and shelter and so forth. So it's a big problem and it's, uh, it's a challenge for uh, service providers. And these are some of the issues really, the underlying, we were talking earlier about the youth population and I know Dr. Clark you were mentioning some of the reasons why these youth become homeless and, and you had a particular um, insight into that. Well, there are a number of uh, reasons. Clearly, uh, there are uh, children who are runaways, um, uh, children who are so-called throwaways. There are children who have uh, have uh, value conflicts with their families. And there's an, another population of uh, youth that uh, often gets ignored, and that is uh, kids who identify themselves as being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, who find themselves at odds with their either family or their community. So they seek refuge in the street, find, trying to find support and understanding. And sometimes they become uh, victims of predators uh, who uh, exploit the, their uh, uh, tragic situations for uh, their own gain. And this is, Richard, I think is per particularly poignant because the youth really do get victimized. Absolutely. And I think the kind of traumas that Dr. Clark was referring to with families also apply to young adults who are often on the streets. There isn't a safe kind of safety net for a lot of those young adults. Uh, and so they tend to form peer support networks, but, um, but life on the streets is difficult, and I think they experience a lot of trauma, which often then um, also leads to uh, substance use as a coping mechanism. Robert, in terms of the Oxford House, at this point, does Oxford House offer uh, uh, families an opportunity to come together, or is it mostly targeting uh, a gender uh, definition of male and female homes? Yes, mostly they are targeting male or female homes. Uh, we do have uh, a, a, a couple, there's not many, 
We want to get more. Funding is always an issue in regards to women with children. Uh, we're actually also looking at the model of men with children, because there's a lot of men out there that, that have taken the responsibility for their children. And uh, the Oxford environment obviously offers a lot of support. And the, the, the few homes that we do have, the individuals that are there with their children thrive. They thrive tremendously because they do have that support and they do have their family with them. So they're better able to concentrate on their recovery. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, what have we learned in our unit, our CHAB unit, and you might want to explain what CHAB stands for, uh, in terms of treating uh, homelessness? Well, I, I think the issue is that SAMHSA has uh, uh, several approaches to addressing the full spectrum of homelessness. There's support of housing, and then uh, the CHAB unit, the uh, co-occurring uh, homeless sec, uh, branch, uh, deals with um, uh, grants to benefit homeless individuals. So again, we try to meet the person where they are rather than prescribing a, a single model. We're fond of saying there are many pathways to recovery. And as Richard pointed out, there are many different individuals with many different needs in, in the homeless uh, uh, population. So we use that diversity of uh, our programming using uh, nonprofit organizations in the community. So you offer services for veterans as, to, as a safety net. Uh, we offer services for people with HIV, uh, 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 young adults or youth or young adults who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, uh, people who are in transitional situations, people who meet the older criteria, with what was called chronic inebriates, people who are frequently intoxicated and go in and out of emergency rooms and in uh, unstable situations. So using our limited resources, uh, what SAMHSA is trying to do is address uh, facilitating permanent housing, but meeting the person who's homeless where they are. If you offer only one model, then you're going to miss a lot of people. And we don't want to be in a situation where we say, if you don't belong to this group, you're, we can ignore you. Uh, the homeless situation requires uh, support. We also want to make it clear that we uh, we provide services at SAMHSA. We don't just uh, do the housing. We have to work with HUD. We have to work with administration and children and families, work with HRSA, work with the Corporation for Support of Housing and, and other nonprofit groups so that we are dealing with the full spectrum. And working, so that would require a very extensive assessment of that individual. Uh, we definitely prefer a case-by-case -case assessment of the individual. So you want outreach workers uh, addressing the unique needs. Why is that person homeless? What are the circumstances? Is it uh, uh, a sexual orientation issue? Is it a family issue? Is it an economic issue? Is it a chronically mental illness issue? What's going on with that person? And do they have potential access to resources or no access to resources? If you don't do it that way, then you, you, you operate on this one size fits all and that generally doesn't work. Dr. Milby, uh, we've thrown around uh, a lot of terminology. Why don't we get you to explain to our audience what co-occurring condition is? Well, co-occurring condition really means that someone has a substance use disorder and in addition has a additional mental disorder. And, uh, and sometimes uh, co-occurring disorder means that they have more than one additional co-occurring disorder. So, Which are? And they can be um, uh, psychiatric diagnoses is usually the way we conceptualize it, additional access one disorders or personality disorders. And they can cover a whole range of things. Um, very commonly, uh, people have a major depression, for example, or dysthymia. And uh, uh, very commonly, people who are homeless or have experienced lots of trauma and have post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, people have other anxiety-mediated disorders. So the whole gamut is um, even simple phobias. People have phobias, and they interfere with their functioning. So um, uh, co-occurring disorders can cover uh, from uh, people who have active uh, psychoses and difficulties with reality contact to people who have stress disorders and everything in between. 
And from an integrated uh, approach, we also like to remind people that uh, some, uh, many individuals who are homeless also have medical conditions that are yes. untreated, and that becomes part of the co-occurring context. So mm -hmm. as well, that, as well. So you know, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, if you're an injection drug user, you may have abscesses that need to be treated. Uh, you mentioned HIV. We want to make sure that a person who is HIV positive is hooked up with Ryan White and can get on medication. The sooner you're on medication, the better off you are. But uh, that does need, mean that indeed those services are available and that the caseworker or case manager is able to uh, recognize that. So it's physical health, it's mental health, and it's substance use disorder at full spectrum. When we come back, we're going to continue to talk about now the treatment of homeless individuals with co-occurring conditions and with addiction problems. We'll be right back. It's important to be familiar with the proper terminology surrounding addiction and recovery. One of the terms you want to be familiar with is co-occurring disorder. Co-occurring disorders are when an individual suffers from both a substance use and mental health disorder, such as anxiety, depression, or other mood disorders. For more information on this and other recovery jargon, visit the Recovery Month website. Mornings used to be the toughest. Before I got treatment for my addiction, it was the little things that were hardest to bear. But now that I'm free of drugs and alcohol, it's the little things that give me the most joy. Recovery. It gave me back my life. Now I can give back. For drug and alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Community Connections has been in existence actually for 25 years. It was started by Maxine Harris and Helen Bergman. Community Connections provides a range of services. We have our uh, community support teams and there are at least five specialties within those teams. Uh, uh, addictions and co-occurring disorders, uh, criminal justice involvement and recovery from the criminal justice system. Uh, wellness and recovery and recovery from violent victimization. We also provide a host of other services. We have a psychiatric clinic. Uh, we work with children and adolescents. We have a huge housing program. So there's really a range of services that we offer here at the agency. I didn't know what direction I was heading. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I, um, I was on the verge of giving up life and everything until Community Connection decided to take me in. There's people in here that know my name and know me, and I don't even know them, but I always hear them call my name out. So I felt very comfortable realizing that, you know, I had people around here that care about me. There are really three different things that we think about all the time. One is to develop a relationship with our consumers. People have been marginalized and they've been cast off oftentimes and they need somebody who believes in them and who can create with them a sense of hope. The way I show support is by going into the field with consumers um, and supporting them while in the field sometimes I will advocate for them and what that means is where they're not able to use their voice possibly because of their past, I step in and show them, model for them a behavior to help them for the next time so they have a kind of practice in the community. If we're in a situation where a doctor 
you know, say is unwilling to do a certain test or they find that it's not necessary, uh, a, a case manager will step in and provide the, re the three best reasons why they should go ahead and go ahead and do the test. Um, because otherwise, in most situations, a, a client might just walk away and say, okay, well, never mind. But we want them to be able to walk into the community and say, I need X, Y, and Z and be able to get X, Y, and Z. We also provide evidence-based practices. The clinical services that we provide are founded in research. There's a strong theory behind them. And we try to train all of our staff so that they're really familiar with the evidence-based practices, the state-of-the-art practices that are, we're using today. We are fortunate enough to partner with Dartmouth College, their PRC Institute, mm -hmm. to work with um, a research fund that we have called WEST. West program, and it's basically a research program where consumers who are struggling with their addiction, and it's a voluntary study, and they can come in um, by their choice, of course. So how are you feeling today? I'm feeling totally fine. I'm totally fine. One of the services that we offer is called dual diagnosis case management, also known as DDCM, and they go through that phase for the first six months, and then after that, if they do really well, they can phase into the intervention for six months, which is group, um, Weiss group, as well as um, trim group. And then if the three interventions are Weiss and trim, um, contingency management, and as well as naltrexone, which is a medication for people who are struggling with alcohol addiction. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, everybody doing okay? Yes. 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 Finally, we're devoted to helping people with practical problems. Uh, people come to us homeless, they come to us poor. Uh, we're interested in helping people develop a range of resources so that there's more of a cushion between them and between them being on the streets. I was walking down the street by myself mm -hmm. and no one was out there. And I looked back, I saw a shadow and I ran. Mm -hmm. And that was my shadow I ran from. This time around, you know, I, I feel I want recovery. I want something. I have goals I want to reach. Community connection is beautiful. The facilitators are nice. The caseworkers are nice. And, you know, whatever area you need help in, they need to help you with our open arms, you know. Dr. Clark, what are some of the most effective approaches to dealing with individuals that are homeless and that have an addiction problem or a co-occurring condition? I think the most important thing when you talk about approaches is that you do have an individualized assessment of the person. You screen for the full range of issues from SAMHSA's point of view that would include mental health issues, trauma, substance use, et cetera. But remember, we're dealing with somebody who is homeless, so we need to know what else, what are what other situations are going on. Am I homeless because of economics? Am I homeless because of domestic violence? Am I homeless because of uh, a physical problem that needs to be addressed? Am I a veteran who may have access to resources? Uh, will I benefit from peer support? These are all questions that case the person doing the assessment should be asking. So then uh, you can move forward. If uh, I'm addicted to opioids, might I benefit from a, an opioid treatment program using something like methadone or buprenorphine? Uh, these are all things that need to be addressed. And if you, in your assessment, aren't uh, addressing those, then in your treatment plan, you're not uh, accommodating those needs. And so again, there are many pathways in the treatment approach, but the, I, I think the hallmark is a very good assessment of where the individual is, what some of the causal factors are, and what the service needs should be. But the whole thrust is to support that person, uh, to move that person into a permanent housing situation, mm -hmm. but recognizing that they, everybody presents with their own unique set of issues and those issues need to be assessed. Dr. Milby, beyond what Dr. Clark has mentioned, talk to us about some of the more innovative efforts that you're familiar with. Well, um, one, of the, one of the innovative approaches, I think, is uh, the kind of thing we've been using in Birmingham where uh, people who are homeless and we're, we're especially focusing on people who have crack cocaine dependence and are homeless and also have non-psychotic co-occurring disorders. So these people are entered into an intensive treatment program. 
and they're offered housing that is absent and contingent. It's, uh, they're modest uh, apartments. Uh, they are provided with a box of food and flatware and cookware, and uh, it's a furnished apartment. Handed the key, and then this, this, uh, we tell them tomorrow morning the van will pick you up and bring you into treatment. Make sure you be there. And, but next week, you need to start giving us clean urine specimens in order to stay here. So we call that abstinent contingent housing, and that's been very effective. So it's dependent um, on their sobriety, on their staying so, off of drugs. And participating in treatment actively. And the interesting thing is, and people forget this part, but it's very important, if they are not abstinent, then we transport them to a secure shelter, but the next day the van picks them up in the shelter and brings them back to treatment. And they continue in treatment until they can get back into their furnished apartment. And we keep doing that as long as it takes till they're able to initiate recovery and sustain abstinence and move forward. Richard, this denotes a real difficulty in, in getting individuals that have an addiction problem that are homeless into a, a permanent situation, does it not? Talk a little bit about what your approach is in Connecticut. Right. Well, actually, we're a national organization, and around the country, we work with a number of different nonprofit organizations that provide supportive housing. And, uh, you know, they generally fall within one of two different kinds of service approaches. One, that are really tailored towards people who are in recovery and that provide the kind of supports, um, case management, counseling, uh, and referrals to ongoing treatment uh, for people who are in recovery. Um, but then another category that I think is emerging and growing, which are what we generally refer to as housing first approaches, that are targeted towards people who are addicted but who um, recovery may be a, a very distant um, um, thing in the, in the future, or at least at least um, uh, abstinence anyway. Um, but um, these are folks who um, have spent years on the streets or in shelters and who have very severe kind of addiction issues, uh, and where the goal is primarily to to first um, take away the the kind of immediate traumas of homelessness by placing them into housing, and then wrapping them with the kind of assertive supports that um, but tries to build a relationship and tries to help them feel acclimated to housing um, as a step towards um, having them build the kind of cognitive skills that enable them to see treatment. Robert, Oxford House, do, they do require abstinence, correct, in correct. order for the individual? Is it a testing scenario? O ordinarily, no. Uh, generally speaking, when we, when we individuals apply for membership in Oxford House, they generally are coming from a, uh, a treatment program. Uh, or they even may be coming from a shelter, but they've had some some uh, measured uh, moments of abstinence where they haven't used. Uh, we tend to go through the interview process, and and we 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 try to gauge, generally speaking, where the person is in regards to their own recovery, because we are a peer to peer peer to peer support. We're peer to peer support. Uh, we don't have professionals online to be able to. Uh, diagnose or, or, or treat any particular type of, of situation. It's all about I'm like you and we can help each other best. Uh, so in, the, in, that, in that regard, I think that the, the model itself works very well, very well, because it's all about the desire from the individual. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the whole criminal justice issue. Uh, about 19 percent of those in federal prisons and 30 percent of those in local uh, jails are homeless. What what is that dynamic about, and and what what are we doing to really help those individuals that have been intercepted? And I'm sure that they probably pick them up if they're if they're having an addiction problem. Someone calls up and says, "I think somebody has died, or <laughs> they look like they're dead," and either they end up in the emergency room, and from there they may take them away. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And actually, we've been working on this quite a bit over the past couple of years. We have an initiative called the Returning Home Initiative, in which we're working with a number of states and uh, jurisdictions around the country. Uh, and the basic idea is that we want to create permanent supportive housing to prevent people who are being discharged from corrections, often who have homeless backgrounds, um, from um, having to go to the streets only to become uh, reincarcerated, either That's due right. to rearrest or because of parole uh, or technical violations. Uh, and we've had a lot of success. Um, one of the other populations I think that's important is, uh, to look at is people who are cycling between um, local jails and homeless services as well as using many other uh, emergency services that are costly. And these are uh, a small set of individuals who end up using a lot of the same, a lot of resources and, and cost um, states and local jurisdictions a lot of money. And these, what we call frequent users of jails, shelters, and other services are a population that we've been particularly concerned about and where we've worked with uh, correction agencies around the country to create um, a, a model that we call FUSE, Frequent User Service Enhancement Program, and that is a, um, able to help 
uh, individuals to break their cycle of incarceration, homelessness, and also address their addiction and mental health issues. Well, when we come back, I want to continue along the lines of what homelessness is costing this nation. We'll be right back. For more information on National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, events in your town, and how you can get involved, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. People trapped by drug or alcohol addiction often feel like there's no hope, no way out. But for every lock, there's a key. And if you have a problem, it's good to know there are real solutions to help you get free. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. People who suffer from drug or alcohol addiction sometimes say hurtful things. They drive the people who love them most away. If you know someone who suffers from drug or alcohol addiction, listen. Try to hear what they are really saying. Know that there is hope and help them find their voice again. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Directions really is the only program specifically designed to serve homeless veterans with co-occurring disorders. We're a long-term treatment program, which really means that we look at every aspect of the veteran's life. We help them change their lives, change their behaviors, and really have the skills that they need to be able to succeed on the outside once they leave New Directions. They leave New Directions with a job, with an income, with the skills, the life skills that they need to continue out in the society, and friends and a community, and integrated into the 12-step community. I have become this way through my use of drugs and alcohol. They have the in these walls the in New Direction, you're safe. You can go through all the emotions and traumas of life and be able to find a remedy or a solution or a cognitive therapy way to deal with it. A lot of people don't understand about dual diagnosis. I would not have been allowed to stay in a regular program. My mental illness, uh, my symptoms, included a lot of mania. Uh, I was constantly looking for things to do. I couldn't control it. It's gotten to the point now when the daughters call with disasters and stuff, I can use my third step and leave it to faith that it's going to work out. I came in the door begging for help. I just could not calm down. And it took, it took the three months of them putting up with my behavior before I even started listening. And then of course we got into the 12 step process, which helps you grow as a person. And between the, the two processes, learning to deal with mental illness and the 12 step process, I got lucky and I came out with a chance. It's up to them whether they want to do a type of what we call cognitive exposure therapy um, and addressing uh, some of the experiences that they have that have been traumatic. We detail the experience with them, we go over it repeatedly, we talk about some of the emotions that might have gotten stuck uh, within uh, those experiences that they had. And then it's just a, basically about them letting it out and addressing it and confronting it. And I think really what we try to promote here is if you kind of confront the pain, you'll reduce the pain. They have continually and repeatedly medicated and self-medicated their pain through drugs and alcohol. We're teaching them about where does that come from? Let's, let's direct our energy and resources towards the problem. And that problem is often, often rooted in the traumatic incident or experiences that they've had throughout their lives. To, to see a, a veteran come in in the beginning, you know, with a lot of doubt, um, a lot of uh, uh, coming from off the street, not having anything, uh, separated from the family for years, and to watch them uh, to begin to uh, uh, transform back into the individual that they once was before, uh, uh, reuniting, reuniting back with their family members. We have the saying in here that uh, we give back what it was so freely given to us. And uh, that's what the uh, graduates do. You know, they come back and uh, share it with their clients. Little things like sitting down with a guy and going over what's a realistic budget or how to buy furniture or 
it's okay to go to a garage sale and get dishes. You know, it's a little things that I had to be taught, retaught. And it's a pleasure to see a guy go out and with $20 and come back with a whole kitchen or a whole bedroom set and find out, well, I can do this. You can live, you know, with whatever means you have. It's how you live with it. And that's the biggest thing for me, is showing them that I had the opportunity to do it, be shown how to do it, and enjoy living that way. I'm happy. We have this motto of being the last house on the block, and I really, true, uh, I truly do believe in that, in that we take the most severe cases um, of mental illness and substance abuse disorders. Um, so really what our agency focuses on is giving guys you know, a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. It's not easy. So if you're looking for three hots in a cot, it can be provided. But what you will come out of it, if you just open your mind and give an opportunity, is a new way of living or really put you back into the way you were before you got caught in your homelessness or your mental illness or your substance abuse. It actually opens the door for a soldier to stand on his feet again. Dr. Milby, what are some of the costs to society uh, in terms of homelessness? Well, I mean, it provides um, a homeless person, if we're providing services, we're, we're having the cost of shelter we provide. But uh, some of the other things that uh, probably less well recognized is homeless people wind up in the emergency room, lots of times, repeated times a year. That's very expensive for society because we all, as taxpayers, pay for that. Uh, they wind up in jail, and uh, to incarcerate someone is very expensive. Uh, so the costs of, of a homeless person just being allowed to continue in homelessness uh, is, is very high for society. And some studies have estimated it may be 30 to 40 some thousand dollars a year per person. And some people, if they're repeatedly hospitalized, are costing society Tremendous. Tremendous costs, yeah. well over $100,000 a year. And conversely, you know, if we were able to assess, as Dr. Clark has mentioned, find them some permanent housing, and what other aspects uh, are necessary? Uh, employment? Well, we haven't talked about that, and I think that is important. I think uh, many homeless people um, have the potential to get back into the workforce. Um, in our studies, most of the people on average have been employed for five and a half years before they were homeless. So these are people that have the capacity, many of them, to return to the work, workforce. And uh, I think the uh, programs that uh, do the initial assessment, as Dr. Clark was saying, and find that they have that history and they want to get back, they don't have a, a disability that would interfere, then uh, the service package needs to include um, employment and uh, vocational assessment. And what are their skills? And where have they uh, worked before successfully? And training. And, then, and training, providing new training. And, and uh, in our part of the country, we provide transport and take them to interviews. We provide opportunities to practice interviews and how mm -hmm. to dress and what to say and so forth. And mm -hmm. we help them prepare resumes even. Oxford House. Yes. In terms of when a person goes to an Oxford house, since, since it's such a good model, uh, do they already have a job? Does the Oxford model provide the jobs for the person, or are you sending them out and saying, you've got to go out and you've got to find a job? Basically, when you come to an Oxford house, uh, employment is not a mandatory thing. You don't have to have a job. Obviously, uh, being that Oxford House is self-supported and self-run, they must uh, at some point in time uh, be able to financially maintain their membership. It's a membership uh, situation. Uh, what we found is that a lot of times, especially with the homeless, what we don't have is immediate funds availability to move into an Oxford House. Uh, that's something in which we work with uh, uh, SAMHSA and other state and local agencies to try to uh, procure funds to allow the homeless just to subsidize them for a month or so, to give them that, that, that time to, to, to get comfortable, uh, get the support structure, then we have a lot of resources. One of the things in which we're doing in Oxford House is we're creating a member resource directory mm -hmm. for all of our members. We know what your skill level is, as Dr. Bilby was talking about. We know what the skill level is. We are, what, what, what is your chosen field of endeavor? What's your educational background? That gives us a directory when we go to our corporate sponsors, when we deal with the state and local agencies in mm -hmm. regards to their resources to, to better be able to match up. 
And you yourself, you have a construction company now. You're a businessman. Would you, how willing are you to take on individuals that are at Oxford Houses and, and provide employment? Oh, 100% willing because I know first and foremost that the, they, they're, they're trying to better their position. They're trying to better their situation. They're obviously, they've accepted the fact that they have an illness and they want to do something about it, and they're trying to repair their lives. They're the, to me, and especially being an, an alumni and being an Oxford member, uh, there, there's no one better that you can give an opportunity to. Richard, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I think the, one of the um, growing areas that I think needs to have more focus is around um, uh, employment services that are also tailored to supportive housing tenants. Um, and we did a big push several years ago to um, do what we called vocationalize the home front, uh, essentially have services um, focused on employment built into supportive housing. And, you know, we had some success with that. I think the, the biggest challenge was that uh, some of the mainstream systems that are out there that help provide employment supports aren't necessarily tailored to the needs of people who are homeless and who have both addiction and mental health um, issues. And um, I think um, having some of those mainstream systems become more adapted to the needs of that particular population um, would go a long way to helping people find employment services mm -hmm. uh, and apply, find employment. Is it possible to prevent homelessness, Dr. Clark? Well, I think that's one of the things that we need to include. The, the word prevention, preventing homelessness or preventing some of the problems associated with uh, homelessness by addressing uh, the homeless situation early. So clearly, uh, in order to prevent homelessness, you need to know the root cause. You need to be able to deal with the, the root cause. Uh, if the uh, precipitating root cause has to do with substance use, then dealing with substance use would help prevent homelessness if it is to deal with uh, uh, mental health issues like depression, anxiety, trauma, then you want to deal with that. Uh, or once a person becomes homeless, it's important to recognize that that person then is more vulnerable to substance use, more vulnerable to some psychological reactions. And part of the intervention, part of the services that Richard talked about is beginning to address uh, some of the psychological issues and the substance use issues so that you don't develop more compound or complex uh, mental health or co-occurring problems. You don't develop a full-blown substance abuse problem because you're self-medicating, trying to cope. So the word prevention then goes to the larger societal issue and then to the programmatic issue. I think one of the other promising approaches around prevention is also uh, to look at ways to structure housing and services that can actually inreach into some of the institutions that discharge people to homelessness. Um, I think there's a big push right now to do prevention in the community through the homeless and ra rapid rehousing programs that, that HUD is, is uh, funding. But in addition, I think there needs to be more of a focus on both institutions and programs where, um, that are serving people who then become homeless after discharge, including uh, substance abuse treatment programs, um, hospitals, uh, jails, uh, mental health institutions. Very good. Any thoughts? Well, just it, the, the partnership that, that we at Oxford House are starting to establish and have established with the various uh, justice agencies and social agencies is, 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 is paramount, and especially in, in, in providing the service of, of dealing with the homeless, especially after treatment, because a lot of times people aren't aware uh, when they come out of, of, of jail or, or treatment centers they aren't aware so we find as you said we're going back going into these agencies doing presentations making them aware and at the same time providing them with that opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer support for housing to repair their lives you know I we have a homeless ministry in, in my church that I go to and I often see even family members trying to do outreach when we have special suppers and, and they come in. If I had a person that had a homeless problem, what resources are available for me or what should I do in that situation, Dr. Milby? I think the first thing is to, you know, um, um, if you discover someone is at risk for becoming homeless or they're initially homeless, to, um, if you don't know the resources yourself, get them to someone who does know, who can do the initial kind of assessment that Dr. Clark is talking about, and then get them connected with what they need. Robert, final thoughts. The most important thing I can think of right now to think of is the fact that that is that the Oxford model, which is a self-supported, self-run recovery homes for individuals, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a marvelous tool. I think that one of the major issues as regards to homelessness is being able to fund, to subsidize that initial 
30 days of being in a, that type of environment to get your foot firmly set on the ground, to be able to go out and, 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 and take advantage of the social service agencies, the job employment agencies, and start moving forward. Richard. I think I want to emphasize that permanent supportive housing um, is not only cost effective, we talked about the cost of homelessness, and we know that supportive housing is a, a lot more cost effective and a more humane solution. Uh, I think the other aspect of, of supportive housing is that it's also saving lives, that mm -hmm. homelessness, um, and when you add on mental health and substance issues, is, is a leading cause of death in this country, and we need to create permanent supportive housing uh, not only to help people um, seek treatment and become in recovery, but often just to save their lives. And Absolutely. Dr. Milby? So I think that uh, those of us who are providing services and doing research on the homeless situation, I think we find ourselves uh, with a gap in our knowledge. And the, one of the important gaps, I think, is just how best to provide intervention and services for people with serious mental illness who also are homeless and have a substance use disorder. Okay. And one approach is the one we use, the absent and contingent housing and intensive behavioral day treatment. Another is housing first. And I think we need more uh, research to address that gap and what are the people that most appropriately respond to housing first and what are the people that need the absolute contingent housing? Dr. Clark. Well, obviously, uh, homelessness is of major importance to uh, our administrator, Pam Hyde, and to SAMHSA, uh, working to provide the critical services that have been mentioned uh, is an important part of that. We, uh, using our grant portfolio, are trying to make sure that in the Housing First context, mental health and substance abuse wraparound services are provided. I've mentioned our SOAR program that our Center of Mental Health Services has, and then uh, dealing with uh, people who are in transitional or shelters because that's where they are, uh, as was pointed out. Those are the things that we're doing. And I'd also like to put in a pitch for our, our Access to Recovery program, which allows wraparound services to be provided. It's a, a state-run uh, program. We are in uh, 19 uh, jurisdictions and uh, five tribe, tribal organizations, and we allow wraparound services, including facilitated housing and employment services, to be an integral part of, of that uh, uh, process. So uh, working with our partners at HUD, our partners at the Department of Justice, as well as the Administration for Children and Families, we are trying to make sure that the federal government plays an, uh, uh, a critical partnership with the uh, NGOs in the community. Excellent. Well, I want to remind our audience that September is National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month. I want to encourage you to go to the website, www.recoverymonth.gov, to get more information and to get engaged and do an event in September. It's been great having you, great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of alcohol and drug use disorders and highlight the effectiveness of treatment. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning organizing and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to addiction treatment and recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. It's important that everyone become involved because addiction is our nation's number one health problem and treatment is our best tool to address it. Mm -hmm.